I've invited a friend to come and spend the last 10 minutes or so with me up here on the stage. And uh, this is a unique guy. Come, Rich, and uh, I want you to join me up here. Um, I'm going to introduce to you Rich Stearns, who is the president of World Vision. And would you just give him a, a round of applause here? And uh, the reason I wanted to have a brief chat with Rich is uh, he was rich once. Rich, really rich once. And I want to talk to you, I want to talk with him a little bit about his life and about a decision he made along the way. And uh, we're going to be challenged by this in this conversation the next few moments. So, Rich, I want to start by saying you didn't grow up in an affluent home. Tell us a little bit about the home you grew up in. Well, that's right. I, uh, sometimes I say I was raised by wolves, but uh, I grew up in a home with a father who was an alcoholic. Uh, he'd had three marriages and ultimately three divorces. Um, neither one of my parents went to high school. And uh, when I was 10 years old, my whole world fell apart. My parents broke up, uh, they got divorced, the bank foreclosed on our house, my father went bankrupt, and uh, as a 10-year-old kid, I found myself just kind of drowning, uh, wondering how I was going to survive. In fact, uh, we're going to talk in a second about a book that you wrote about some of this stuff, yeah. but you actually, at 10 years old, were in bed one night and you realized, my parents aren't going to help me. Yeah, I, I remember that night. I think all of us have those moments that you never forget. But I was a little kid, and uh, my father had come home drunk again. And uh, there was a shouting match going on in the kitchen as my mother screamed at him about being gone for three days and coming home drunk and not having money to pay the bills and all of that. And uh, I just realized that moment that my parents couldn't take care of me, that they they couldn't help me with my problems because their problems they couldn't solve. They couldn't solve their own problems. And somehow that night in the heart of a child, I realized that I was on my own. That if I was going to make it, I would have to do it without the help of my parents. And uh, I kind of started to form a plan that in, when I was 18, I, I had this idea I could be independent and, and that maybe I could make my own way in the world. And you weren't a Christian at I was time. not a Christian, no. And so you just decided to do odd jobs, and you went on a letter-writing campaign to try to get into a school. Well, that's right. When I was about 13, and other kids were dreaming of being a baseball player or a fireman, uh, I got out an old royal typewriter and wrote letters to all eight Ivy League schools and asked for their catalogs. And I would sit in bed at night looking at the, you know, the Princeton and the Cornell catalogs, dreaming that maybe someday I could... Maybe a miracle would happen, and I could do that. And I knew somehow that education was going to be the way I could escape from this, yeah. that that was the way out. And you did wind up going to Cornell, and uh, you got scholarship there, but you worked. What were some of the odd jobs as you worked through Cornell? Well, I started at the bottom cleaning toilets at a nursing home. That's, uh, if you want to start at the bottom, that's pretty much it, believe me. Uh, but, I mean, I did all kinds of things. I was a paper boy in high school. I, I, I bagged groceries. I, I uh, cleaned toilets. I worked at the country club and cleaned people's golf clubs when they were done playing golf. When I was in college, I drove a taxi for two summers, and I used to dream. My American dream at that point was someday I'd sit in the back of a taxi. I'd never <laughs> sat in the back of a taxi. I was only the driver. And then uh, after Cornell, you uh, took out some loans and went to the Wharton School of Business. That's right. I went, I went to the Wharton School and, and got my MBA there. And, and actually, uh, and perhaps the only living person that became a Christian at the Wharton School, uh, <laughs> gave my life to Christ at the Wharton yeah. School. As you may know, they worship a different God there. Yeah. And, uh, but there I was. Okay. And then fast forwarding ahead, you became the CEO of a fairly good sized company when you were 33 years old. That's right. I, I, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Big with Tom Hanks where uh, this little boy gets in an adult's body and he ends up being a genius at a toy company. Well, I got a job at Parker Brothers Games when I was 25 and uh, 
when I was 33, I was named CEO and president. It was a $250 million company with about 1,000 employees. And it was partially because I still had a mind of a child and I, I could figure out what, what games that kids wanted to buy and was very successful at doing it. But. And then a few years after that, you accepted the CEO position of Lenox Fine China. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies, for your support. I, uh, yes. I don't know. If, I did a little research on this, but uh, this is where the White House gets all of its China and the embassies and uh, places uh, around the world. I mean, this is like really, I'm sure I have none in my house is the point that I'm making. Well, this, this is one of those places where, where ladies get an abundance of possessions, as you, as you preached about. But yeah, it's America's Fine China and Gift Company. Okay. So, I mean, at that point in your life, uh, you were in your dream home? You know, Renee and I, I was in my mid-40s, and uh, Renee and I had bought a 10-bedroom Fieldstone farmhouse built in 1803 on five acres. It was the house of our dreams. Um, everything was coming true in our lives. The American dream was coming true. I used to sit and have those discussions about, I can save up enough money, and we, we can retire at 55 and go to Boca. And, and we used to have those conversations. Of course, my wife said, I'm not going to Boca. We're going to go on the mission field if you ever retire. Ooh. Yeah. I had a good wife. Yeah, that was, no. Can you I'm, hear me? No, that's, uh, those are long discussions, I know. <laughs> so, all right, so you have this uh, high salary, incredibly promising future, and uh, then you get an invitation from World Vision to walk away from all of that. Mm -hmm and to assume the presidency at a fraction of the salary and none of the perks, and uh, when you got that invitation, what did you do? Yeah. Well, as you might recall, because Bill was involved with this, but uh, a recruiter called and, and tried to recruit me to, to throw my hat in the ring for this World Vision job, and I was going to have none of it. You know, I just, that, that was dangerous. I didn't want to go there. I, I could feel the, the spiritual danger of, of that in my life and, the, and the, the conviction that would come. And he wanted to have dinner with me and uh, to meet me. And I said, I won't have dinner with you. You know, it's a waste of time. I'm not qualified. I'm not interested. And then he asked me this question, Bill. He said, are you willing to be open to God's will for your life? Now, if somebody normally asks you that question, you say, yeah, of course I'm willing. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm, I'm willing to be open to God's will for my life. But he asked me that question that day. And you see, behind that question are other questions. Questions like, are you willing to leave that career that that little boy who grew up in poverty worked all of his life for to get there. Are you willing to give that up? Are you willing to give up the financial security that comes with it? How about that 10 bedroom house? Are you willing to sell that, put it on the market, have the moving vans pull up to it? What about that Jaguar XK8 that Lennox gives you to drive? Are you willing to hand the keys back? But even more questions. Are, are, are you willing to enter the pain of the poor? Are you willing to walk into the brothels of the world, the garbage dumps, the slums, the barrios? Are you willing to hold dying children in your arms? Are you willing to do that, Rich? Uh, are you willing to be open to God's will for your life? And all of a sudden, that question is no longer a theoretical question. Yeah. It hits you right in the stomach. Yeah, and you write in the book that you courageously crawled under the covers in your bed when it was coming right down to the wire because you knew what God yeah. was. Well, yeah, I was being chased, uh, pursued by the Lord, and, and I just, you know, you have this question, what does God want me to do? You pray and you pray, what does God want me to do? Sell fine china to the wealthy or help the poorest of the poor? <laughs> you know, and, and believe it or not, I was willing to believe he wanted me to sell fine china to the, yeah. to the rich. And, and, and the, the, at my low point, I, I crawled into a bed, my wife and son were with me in Seattle, and I was just weeping and praying out to God at four in the afternoon in my pajamas. It was pathetic. And my 16-year-old son patted me on the shoulder and said, it'll be okay, Dad. Mom and I are going to go out and get a bite to eat. We'll be back in a couple of hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I was. That was my low yeah. point. 